Welcome back to the Metal Teddy Bear Experience here at 90.3 WMSC up in Montclair. This is your host, Chris. With me in the studio, I have my friend, Aron Tosuni, and say hello. Hello. And we also got a special guest on the line. We got Steve today in. What's up, man? How are you doing? Hey, man. How are you? Thanks for having me tonight. Dude, it's, uh, it's our pleasure to have you on the show. Um, really pumped to talk about you. Uh, I've been following your stuff, your uh, latest singles and all that, and... Uh, Actually, you were just at the 2019 Winter Nam uh, show festival thing. Uh, how yeah, did that go? It was great. Um, it was it was a lot of fun um, for people that have, have or maybe I guess I should say haven't been. It can be a pretty chaotic time. You know, there's a lot of a uh, lot of people there, and um, I basically played for the DR Strings booth and um, basically promoting tracks off the record. Um, you know, had Metal Injection there and you know, a lot of other, you know, good friends there. And, um, so I was playing some songs and yeah, it was, it was a good time. Um, it was, it was chaotic getting there. It's always tough traveling with gear, but there's a little bump in the road, but everything got squared away. So overall, uh, I think it was well received and, you know, very happy to be playing. And this was in California, right? Yeah. It's, it's in Anaheim at the uh, convention center there. So for people that haven't been, it's, uh, I guess from anyone in our area, I'm from New Jersey too, and uh, anyone from the this tri-state area, if you're familiar with like the Javits Center, which is like kind of a big convention center, it's like that, but like times like two or three, it's like enormous, and oh, wow. um, it, it, there's so much like cool gear there, and like every level is just like packed with like uh, every you know distributor and manufacturer you can imagine and so um, there's a lot going on there so it can be almost like a little overwhelming you know and it's over the course of four days and I think to really see everything like you need all four days to be there but if you're a musician you're like a kid in the candy store if when you're over there it's, it's really a good time yeah I mean I always see like you know they always post the videos after like clinics or playthroughs or just like interviews and stuff like that I think actually you just you did a couple interviews there with like heavy New York and stuff like that um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We did that, and um, it was it was pretty cool. So we try to fit in the interviews around the playing, and it's interesting too because at Nam, the, the demonstrations are that they actually limit your sound too. So they have people going around with like decibel meters that like check to make sure like you're within like their regulations and uh, like their like time limit too. It, it's very like interesting performance because you have to not only be focused on playing, but then there are all these sort of outside variables such as like, how long am I playing for? Like, am I playing too loud? Am I doing the right thing? Like all these other things you have to be concerned with outside of just making sure like you're getting all the right notes out. So it's, it's a lot to kind of keep track at one time. Yeah. Cause I, I feel like a lot of artists usually talk about how like, they they do look forward to the event, but they're also very mm -hmm. like they're like oh it's so exhausting. Like you said, like traveling there is just exhausting. But like if you're like a big ticket artist, everyone wants to talk to you. Everyone wants to see yeah. you. You know, it must be really exhausting. But I'm glad like, it went well for you. I'm yeah. glad you worked out and you had a lot of fun, right? Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and uh, and that's definitely true. Like some of the guys that are there, you know, that are um like very seasoned veteran players. Like they can't walk ten feet without getting asked for like an autograph or something so you know and you kind of see who's there and it's it's, it's fun you have a little fangirl moment uh <laughs> your favorite artist happens to walk by so but it's cool and it was, it was fun playing it's fun seeing other players there and if anyone gets a chance to go definitely highly recommend it yeah i've always wanted to go maybe maybe next year i could check it off my bucket list definitely man so uh you are coming out with a brand new album called Follow the Light and it's actually coming out in a couple of days. It's coming out on Friday, yeah. February 1st. And this mm -hmm. album is uh completely independent, right? Yes, it's uh pretty much 100%. We had some um I guess uh other artists I worked with that I guess wouldn't be considered independent artists, but as a as a whole the release I guess would be considered indie. Yeah, and uh you did a lot of the uh like the uh, I wouldn't say like the mixing and like engineering on it or no. I did a lot. I had an active role in the uh, mixing part of it, so I'm not like a mixing or mastering engineer by trade. But I definitely like I knew before I started the record like exactly how I wanted the drums to sound, how I wanted the guitars to sit. So I did have like an active role in making sure like you know, those tones were captured properly. Um, and uh, I did produce the record. So I had a pretty clear vision of how I wanted the, I guess, the final product to be. But, uh, you know, it, it did come together pretty quickly, though, like once the writing process actually started. And I think 
it came together so quickly because, you know, there was definitely a clear vision of like how we wanted to get this out. So we started, I guess, actually writing beginning of 2018 and I guess uh, about half halfway through the year, the writing and most of the tracking was already done. So it was like, yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, I actually had a question about the tracking because I was looking at your uh, your press release for everything, and mm-hmm. um, it said the tracking was done at Room Three Sixty Eight Productions. Yes, which is mm-hmm. in Haworth, New Jersey, right? Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. dude, I that's on Maple Street or Maple Road or whatever. I drive down that like all the time. That's like right. Close oh, do to you home. really? Yeah, yeah. Are you like guys from this the area? Or you were just using that as like a friends or something? Um, he yeah. So I'm from Creskill in Bergen County, and wow. um, okay, and so. Yeah, my engineer is from Haworth, and so that area, there's actually a studio there, and um, yes, we did all the tracking there, and uh, it was good. So we we tracked there, and the mixing was mainly done um, by just a friend of mine who I just have known. He does a lot of mixing and mastering for, like, metal bands. He actually lives, like, in Europe, but, um, you know, it doesn't really matter where you live, right? You just send them the files, and so... He does a lot of work with like tune track products, like Superior Drummer and things like that. So he's very like well seasoned in like how like metal drums should sound, like how like guitar like metal tones like should be. And so we wanted to have like something that was, I guess, like common that people would hear, but at the same time, the tones and and uh, I guess how the EQ was set on a lot of the guitars would be something original at the same time. So we worked pretty hard on getting all of that. So once we actually captured the performance, we edited everything. um, He actually helped kind of bring the songs to life. So I needed like two engineers really on this to help me sort of get the sound that I was hearing in my head. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's a, I mean, you said it took you like a year, right? Yeah. About a year. I would say from start to finish, I would say almost like one year. Yeah. I mean, cause it depends how you look at that. Some people will look at that and be like, wow, that's a really long time. And some people are like, wow, that's really short, you know, because sometimes yeah. bands like two, take two, three years, you know, to work on stuff. But I think a year is like a good amount of time where you're not like rushing yourself. You have time to breathe. And it's also like not too much time to like second guess yourself. Right. Exactly. Because, you know, like this actually started out as an EP. And what happened was. I started getting the artwork back and um and so I had like an artist I was working with and I was telling him this is what I exactly what I want on the album cover this is what I want here and then by the time I got it back it was, it was like looking like really epic like like almost like a like a fantasy type uh, thing for people that are into that and so I was like man this is like a lot of work for just like three or four songs you know and I'm like this would be way better if it was just like an album you know cuz I felt like I was putting all this effort and work into something that would be over so quickly for a listener, you know, like four songs would be go by pretty quickly. So I was like, well, you know what? Like there's no deadline. I'm not like, I don't have a label pressure or anything like that pushing me to get this out. So let me just spend another couple months. And I wrote like another four or five songs at that point. And, uh, and then I had around nine tracks. And I thought, okay, you know, this is like a good length. It's like about 45 minutes. That felt like it was good for an album for me. So, at that point, I was like, you know, instead of just releasing an EP, let me just release an album. It'll be like a, a you know, solo album release. And for me, that just felt better because there was a lot of work that went into the packaging with the CD, with the story and the artwork. So it just felt a lot more natural that way to just make it a full LP. So I actually have a question about EPs uh, compared to full lengths. And I, I get your situation there. But um, in general, what do you think about EPs compared to albums? Do you think they're necessary or kind of like uh, a waste of time? You'd rather just do an album? Like, I know your situation is different, but I'm just asking in like a general, yeah. broad kind of sense. I think in general, for any like local musician listening, EPs and singles are totally the way to go. Um, I think in today's... Um, and, and which is contradicts what my situation was. But I think in general, on average, for most players, I think that's a, a good way to go because in today's society with social media, it's all about releasing content. And I think if you can release like a song a month, for example, that means a lot more than dropping everything in one album and releasing it all at once. And then maybe a month or two later, you're struggling for content to be released. My case was a little bit different because like as a solo player, 
I'm constantly releasing material anyway, whether it's lessons or, um, you know, covers or reviews or whatever. And so this was more or less like a passion project for me. Um, and this concept, well, it's a concept album first and foremost. So even though it's instrumental, um, when people do get the CD, um, or even if actually I should say, even if they get it through Bandcamp, I believe, um, when they stream the tracks, there's a story that accompanies the uh, listing. So for me, it wouldn't have made sense to release them individually because people would have gotten such like a sporadic part of each story that it would have felt like really fragmented and just cohesively like it. I, I, I didn't see that working out well. But in general, if I was just releasing a track of nine songs that I really liked in one album, instead of releasing it as one album, I probably would release it maybe once a month, maybe do a playthrough here, music video here. And so we've been trying to do that because um, we have been releasing on a schedule every couple weeks, a music video, lyric video, playthrough. So we've been trying to be active with releasing that, but just for the sake of the continuity of the album, this just had to be released at one time instead of over a long period of time. I know sometimes with like, when bands like, you know, like newer bands or like, you know, newer like artists and stuff like that, when they release mm -hmm. like uh, full albums and yeah. you listen to the first track or second track and you're not really into it, you're not going to listen right. to the whole 10 tracks on the album. Exactly. You're just going to be yeah. like, all right, next. When it's an EP, That's, you're like, yeah. all right, I already listened to, let me just listen to la the last two or something like that. So I think right. I, I kind of agree uh, what you're saying with definitely like your upcoming band, you should definitely do EPs. For sure. For newer bands, absolutely. I, I definitely think it's the way to go. It's just such a big undertaking, and it's very expensive, too, as a new band. If you're going to get, like, nine tracks mastered and, and mixed, it, it, it's a lot. And you have to be sure that there's an audience for that, too. You know, so, I mean, I know, like, there, for me, like, I have, like, you know, other guitar players that maybe follow me or know me. And so I'm kind of certain that there's at least, a, like, a, a niche there of, like, those kind of, like, guitar shredders that would be interested in this but if you're really really brand new it's it's a hard thing to i think uh to reason to do so i, I totally agree and uh speaking of stuff like you you said you were releasing content all the time or songs and you have a, you released like a playthrough video for uh red river um yeah is that something you enjoy doing or you feel like people ask for it a lot like playthrough videos like what's your opinion on that yeah playthrough videos are interesting you know like um for that song in particular, I think Red River's the most technically demanding track on the record. Um, there's a lot of like, like crazy like tapping and alternate picking stuff, and um, there's certain songs that I think guitar players would enjoy watching just for that alone. Besides like the m melody or the arrangements, um, I think playthroughs are fun because um, for me as a guitar player, I'm always curious, even though like you play an instrument for so long, you have an idea of what's going on, but it's still always fun to watch actually what they're doing. Sometimes, you know, people go even overboard and they'll add like scrolling tab and stuff, which is like, you know, next level. But, you know, for me, I, I think it's like a fun thing to do. Um, it kind of feels like a music video in a way. I mean, I think for this type of music, there's such an emphasis on the guitar playing that even in a music video setting, I think most people just want to see like, what's the guitar player doing? It's kind of like, you know, you watch like Steve Vai or, or Joe Cetriani or I guess any one of those uh, guitar players that are known for instrumental, I guess, rock or metal music. Um, you, know, you you really just want to see like, what are their fingers doing? And so I think it caters to like what I think most people want to see, especially today, because we only really have, you know, on some most social media, like a minute, a minute of like someone's uh, attention span. And so like, whether you're on Instagram or whatnot, so people want to see that. I think it's cool. And I enjoy doing it. It's, it's a fun thing. Yeah. Cause I was wondering if you were going to do like a, uh, like a playthrough for every song on the album or something similar to that. I think so. I think, you know, at, at some point we'll probably release content because each song um, has like a special meaning to me. And like, I think especially with the way things are today, we can't really afford to just put like a filler track on there. Like each track has to be something that you really stand by. And uh, that's why this is nine tracks. It maybe could have been 14 tracks or 12 or whatever, but there's only nine because nine was like what I felt like very strongly about each one. 
So I think at some point as the year progresses, you know, we're releasing a music video on Thursday with Metal Injection. Um, and I think Ultimate Guitar is going to release um, another playthrough, I think maybe the following week. So, um, you know, we're going to either do a playthrough or music video, probably for most of the tracks. Some are more like cinematic sounding. So I don't think we'd maybe do videos for those, maybe like more playthroughs, but we haven't decided on the rest of them. But I do think it's a good idea, you know, because eventually when people listen to it, they'll probably want to see something visual along with just the audio. So we'll probably plan for that in the future, but it'll really depend as the year goes on what we do. Yeah, I know uh, on Ultimate Guitar, you get a lot of love on there. I feel like that's definitely uh, a great site for you. It, You know, because, um, thank you, it's like, there's a certain like demographic I was saying of like people that are really into that technical guitar playing. And I think there's been a definite resurgence of that. You know, you hear bands like animals as leaders and a lot of like instrumental uh, bands, even intervals Um, people are starting to really appreciate, I think guitar again. And so um, that's kind of the niche I've been trying to uh, target. Um, So yeah, there's certain venues where like um, I'll be more active on. That's one of them uh, more active on like, Instagram videos and stuff. So I try and like find out where things pop a little bit and I'll kind of focus my efforts there. But yeah, we, we just look for appropriate outlets that would be interested in showcasing that. And if there happens to be a target audience that would appreciate it too. So it's a fine, uh, delicate balance between that. And, um, also I had a question about, uh, how you release stuff. Like, how do you, uh, like get and choose like when you're going to release or is it just like whenever you want like you said on thursday you're going to release another song like right before the album release like album release on friday yeah. is that something like you wanted yeah you, well the thing is too like this was an interesting time i think to release an album because fourth quarter for an indie artist is a very hard time to release um especially when the holidays come up and then especially when nam comes up too when that's on and and you know like that's hard for anyone to release stuff because the internet is so flooded with gear reviews and what's new for 2019. And I think there's a time and a place when to release things. So it just happened to be that the record was finished and and in my hands by the end of 2018. And we had to decide when do we want to, when would it make the most sense to release this? And I do think that there's a best time of the year, depending on what your situation is. If you're assigned to a major label, doesn't really matter when you release your, your uh, material. Although I, I do think some people believe that there's a best time. I mean, you see artists that are like major artists will release like a surprise album and it doesn't really matter because they have such a strong following. They can do that. But for me, we released it at a good time for when a lot of indie artists would release their music. And then we wanted to build a schedule, like a relatively consistent schedule of, okay, maybe every week or every week and a half or so we'll release some content because I think releasing content on a regular basis, that's like high quality is something that is necessary in order to to start penetrating whatever, I guess, audience you want to hear your music. So we tried to make sure that, we were on a schedule of releasing things on a very regular basis. And so far it's been uh, working out for us. And I would recommend like anyone that is releasing music before you just start releasing something like go in with a plan, because I think that's probably the best way that you'll really penetrate whoever, you know, you want to listen to your stuff. For anyone tuning in right now, you're listening to 90.3 WMSC upper Montclair. This is the metal teddy bear experience. And I'm here with Steve the Dan. So, uh, Steve, on my show, I asked three random silly questions. Are you ready to take part in that? Let's do it. All right. Question number one, I'll ease you into it. I'll give you an easy one. Do you button your shirt top, down, or bottom up? Top down. Top down. There we go. My man. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I was, like, talking to some people about this because I like to test them out on my friends first. There's actually people, those heathens, that actually do go from, from bottom up. I'm like, how do you – that doesn't make sense to me, right? Yeah, they're, they're, uh, yeah, I've got to wonder, like, where are they from? Yeah, you know, like... I was like, go home. I'm like, I don't want to talk to you <laughs> yeah. guys anymore. Uh, but good, you're on my side on this. All right, question cool. number two. What song would you pick to be the soundtrack of your life? Oh, my God. Um, man, that's a really tough question. Soundtrack of my life. <sighs> I feel like... Mm-hmm. Maybe like 
show must go on by Queen. Oh, okay. That's solid. Yeah, I think yeah, because uh, like yeah, that, they're my favorite childhood band. And b- before the movie came out, I was like, ah, they're gonna be everyone's favorite band now. <laughs> but uh, but but no, I felt like uh, yeah, I probably that would be it because I feel like that sort of uh, message behind the the song is something that I've that's resonated with me through, you know, going through I guess all the stages of uh, schooling and music and all the kind of trials and tribulations that come with that. So. May yeah. probably pick that one. It would be something from Queen. I think that song would be it. Well, uh, did you? What did you think of the movie? Do you think it was as good as it's uh, proclaimed to be? I thought it was a great movie. You know, I mean, like, I think, you know, for some people went into it thinking it would be a documentary rather than like a biopic. And I think if you go in with like that expectation, you might be let down because there's certain like anachronisms, like what things that actually happened at which time and sure they were maybe off but i thought like the portrayals of every like band member was like spot on like i thought brian may was more brian may than brian may is in <laughs> real life you know so, so, I, like, i've heard that before it, yeah it was it was really like it was like uncanny some of the resemblance there so overall i really enjoyed it and i think kind of going to a movie at the end of the day you just have to ask yourself like was i entertained did i enjoy this and i had a good time like if you like the music and you're a fan of the band you know, they got all the hits in there. Like, you know, you're, you're watching this, like, really, really close representation of Freddie on a big screen. It's it's hard not to like, but I do see why people would would not like maybe some things that weren't exactly the way they happened in real life. But I think you have to, you know, give them a little liberty just for the sake of the movie. So I, I enjoyed it, personally. I mean, I'm not that huge of a Queen fan. Like, I do enjoy their songs, but I'm not, like, you know, devoted fan or anything. I really yeah. enjoyed the movie, and I really liked the uh, the last you know part where they perform. I thought that was oh, done huge. really well. Yeah, that was so good. Yeah, and I, uh, I I I actually really like your Brian May comment. <laughs> yeah, <That's very laughs> awesome. Uh, but question number three, uh, the last question: What is the most memorable prank you've seen? Like in in life, not on like YouTube or anything like that. Oh, in life, memorable prank. Ah. <sighs> Man, that's a tough one. Um, hmm. I'm trying to think, like, what would be a good what best prank? Hmm. Or you could do, like, a funny one or any prank that you want to talk about, basically, and explain. <laughs> we always like prank well, stories there was on one, here. There was one prank that I just saw that was on uh, – Now I was watching this uh, video. I think it was, like, one of those late-night shows, and um, – this isn't me personally about me personally, but I thought just thought this was funny. Um, these like two artists were like having a, I guess like they were having an argument out, whether it was over Twitter or whatever. And uh, I forget who it was, but artists basically bought like the front like four rows of that other artist's like tour, like uh, on his uh, on one of his shows. So the front four rows, he bought all the tickets. <laughs> And so um, I think it was like between two rappers or something. And like, I, I thought it was like the funniest thing because, you know, when you get out on stage and you start playing, once the lights hit you, you can't really see past the first four rows anyway. So when you're playing live, like, and you get out there on stage and there's no one in the front four rows, like it's almost impossible to like <laughs> have any energy. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, was, I thought that was like the most like, brilliant thing that like just to get back it's kind of like petty but yeah, yeah, yeah like to get back at the guy he bought those all those tickets i don't know maybe there's like 200 tickets or however it was for that club or, or that um that venue uh so it, it, it was pretty petty but i thought at the same time that was pretty genius too yeah that that, that would totally uh mess with my mind going out out there i don't <laughs> yeah. know I'm like oh okay i'm not this is not for me now <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> go home um so that was the random silly question segment i hope you had fun with that i know i did Awesome. And, uh, yeah, so do you have any release parties set up, any tour dates, any shows you want to talk about? So, yeah, we're going to um, have uh, – I would recommend anyone that's listening, uh, they can definitely check our uh, Facebook page. Um, we're going to be posting uh, very soon um, some dates. We're going to be doing um, some guitar clinics locally for any musicians that happen to be out there. Um, we'll be doing, uh, you know, tracks off the record. Um, demos, technique stuff uh, for people that are into that. Um, I play ESP guitars, so we'd be promoting that too. 
Um, so that would be fun, I guess, more on the technical side. But on the show side, um, we'll probably be doing some shows. I think at St. Vitus Bar in Brooklyn. Um, so nice. uh, we're going to be getting some dates down. And uh, as soon as we do, they'll all be uploaded onto our social media pages. And uh, we'll be promoting that. So anyone listening, they can uh, hop there, um, like or subscribe or follow, whatever you feel to do. And, uh, yeah, just to stay up to date, we'll have all that there. Dude, awesome. St. Vitus is uh, one of my favorite venues. It's it's small, intimate, and uh, you know the most metal bar you can go to. Uh, yeah, man, it's it's like a it's like a staple right now. You know, there's not too many, but they're holding it down. Hell yeah, dude. Well, uh, thank you so much for calling in and talking about your brand new album. That's Follow the Light. It comes out February first, which is in a couple days. It comes out Friday, guys. So make sure you pick it up. Thanks again, Steve. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me, man. I, I appreciate it too. Dude, anytime. And maybe we'll run into each other because I live right in Cloister. <laughs> oh, do you really? Oh, no way. So, yeah, I'm always uh, I'm always in that area anyway, so I may run into you. You never know. Yeah, right there, dude. That's crazy. Because, uh, like, you really – when I talk to people, they're usually from California or upstate or not – like, not Cresco. Like, everyone's like, what is Cresco? Yeah. What is Harworth? You know what I mean? So that's really cool. Yeah, no no one no. Even people in New Jersey, you know, if unless they're from, like, the area, they, they won't know, you know? So, yeah, like – um. Like one of the guitar clinics that we're, that's getting set up is going to be at Odebell and Bergenfield. So, um, oh, look at that. If, yeah, so it's going to be right there. They're an ESP dealer. They deal Mesa Boogie. So it's just nearby, and um, you know we know them well, and so it'd be something easy to do. And uh, you know, local, I think you know get a good reception there. So yeah, we're going to be setting that up. I'm not sure when what the date on that is, but I know like it's in the works. I think we have to get some things uh, approved first, but it's definitely going to happen i don't know when but we'll be uh promoting that as uh, as soon as it does but yeah i mean yeah man feel also feel free to keep in touch too um if you find me on social media i'll you know follow you back or whatever so uh, i can keep you updated on anything that happens yeah man definitely we will do thanks a lot of fun awesome man and thanks for having me on the show i really appreciate you covering it no nah, dude it's our pleasure we always love having guests on the show i was actually um actually stopped by i don't know do you know nick perkel yeah yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, I um, actually stopped by Montclair maybe two years ago um, to to promote something, and so I uh, I I know he's not working there anymore. But uh, when I saw Montclair, I just had like really good memories of uh of that. So I was I was definitely glad to uh to have this connection kind of brought back again. It's very cool. Yeah, he used to have the uh, the Japan Knicks uh, pandemonium. That was it. Yeah. Yeah, he was that here was for a long yeah. time. Yeah, going back. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you, man. I won't keep you any longer. Enjoy your night, and I uh, look forward to seeing you at St. Vitus. Yeah, man. Thanks. I appreciate it. I'll see you around. Take care.